A very warm welcome to Lansdowne this morning. We're delighted to see you here uh, for morning worship. And of course, we welcome our friends who are joining us online. It's good to have the extra hour. I hope you've used the extra hour um, uh, this morning well and good to be gathered together for worship today. We're going to praise God in our opening songs as we remind ourselves of what it means to be believers in the Lord Jesus and to have God as our Father. Let's pray together and then we'll sing. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Father, we've come to praise You this morning through Jesus your Son, our Savior. We've come in the power of the Holy Spirit to worship you, to rejoice in your name, to acknowledge your glory and greatness in the world and in our lives. So we join with a million times million people all over the world praising Jesus today. We're part of that worship circle that extends through the universe, through the cosmos. Praise the Lord, you His angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding, who obey His word. Praise the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, you His servants who do His will. Praise the Lord, all His works everywhere in His dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Father, we offer you our worship now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing.
please find your seats. Again, a very warm welcome. I'm looking for the Imika family, our Nigerian friends. We're hoping to dedicate their little one, uh, Ivy, this morning. And I've been patrolling the premises, trying to find them. They're not here, are they? No? It's African time. I appreciate that. So um, <laughs> they may yet arrive. Um, Julian, come and join me. Uh, not for the dedication, but for... Um, <laughs> we're going to talk to you later in the service. Let's do it now. Let's see if, uh, if Daniel and, um, uh, and Ivy uh, uh, and uh, um, Josephine uh, and Heavenly... Yes, we have a, a Heavenly now who comes to church, a little boy called Heavenly, the brother of, 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 of Ivy. I'm still looking around the congregation trying to see if they're here. No, okay. Yes, it's the hour change. change. Yes, it could, it could be that. It could well be that. Their clocks may not have um, been uh, put right. Julian, um, we're thinking in our service this morning about this theme of sharing with one another. Now, you, you've been in, in Lansdowne for a, a couple of years, and, and much of that time has been personally quite challenging for you because... Uh, you, you, you've been looking after your wife, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago. So during those two years, uh, you and Jill, you, you've had an interesting kind of time of it uh, as a couple. But what is it therefore meant to you to belong to a church family like, like, like ours? Uh, we've actually here before COVID, actually, but then COVID affected us. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we came here. And uh, so you know, my wife, I nursed for 19 months, uh, and she died uh, um, just over a month ago and was buried a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we were in a situation that we were changing churches, and we just found that when we came here, this church was just right for us. And it was nice to know that my wife and I liked this situation. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really trying hard not to. Um, but um, yes, we were married for 61 years, so it's quite difficult to, um, to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was told that she had three months to live, and I nursed her at home for 19 months. And that was quite difficult, but we had to, but we had a lot of help from this church, and that was tremendous. It wasn't just cards, it wasn't just telephone calls, it wasn't just WhatsApp, but it was uh, people coming to visit us and all sorts of things. And um, certainly Peter and Sean were brilliant with us uh, during that difficult time, and many in this church actually helped us. And, and in spite of all those kinds of pressures, I know that you, you plugged into what you could, you got involved in a small group, you, you, you served in various ways in, in the life of the church. So... so for you, Julian, presumably, uh, uh, belonging to Jesus by faith means belonging to his people. Uh, and over the years, God has blessed you in lots and lots of ways. And I've observed you as somebody who is very generous. Uh, you, you, you give uh, of your time and your love and, your, and of, your, of your energy. What, what, why, why are you wired up in that way? What, what is it about, about sharing your life with others that really is a blessing to you? Uh, well, my mother told me that she put me in Sunday school age three. And that was 80 years ago, okay? So I've been connected with churches for at least 80 years. Um, and, uh, uh, and I just find that that is part of my life. I've been to several churches uh, throughout my lifetime, as you would imagine, because I've changed jobs and that sort of thing. Uh, but I just find that the fellowship and the friendship is so important to us. I know we come here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I accept all of that. Uh, but also, I love the scriptural teaching which is here. It's very sound. Um, I love the, the music. I just want to mention this group. I mean, they practice what one evening before they come here. Oh, they're very polished. But there's a lot that goes on in volunteering. And I know that we've got this situation in church that it's driven by many people. I know we have our salaried staff here. I know that. But we've got so many volunteers. And I know 
you would want me to say you need more volunteers because <laughs> because he's always. I didn't ask you to say that. I assure you. <laughs> no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. So um, yeah, there is. And, and practically, Julian, um, how how have you begun to share your faith and share your life in Jesus with others how, how, within Lansdowne now? How are you beginning to use your time and, and your gifts uh, and indeed your, your generous financial giving? How have you got involved in that way? Uh, well, I just know that a church needs help. Um, I mean, I'm, I think you've got 10 salaried staff people here at the moment, but look what else goes on. And uh, somebody did tell me, is that your visitor just arrived? Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Daniel, uh, welcome. Yes. <laughs> are, you, are the rest of the family going to join you? Good. <laughs> Carry on, brother. Carry on. I don't know what I was saying. Then, don't you but just there love church when it, this kind of thing happens? <laughs> um, we got salaried staff. Uh, yes. But we've got lots more people who are volunteers. Yes. And you got involved in something called In Touch in the last yeah. um, yes. few, few weeks? Yes. Uh, it, very interesting. I'm, I'm a retired street pastor, so I know what dealing with the people that are um, less fortunate than we are have to put up with. And this church on a Tuesday and uh, a Friday actually feed up to 70 people with hot meals um, at midday. But what you don't know is the kitchen staff come in at half past seven in the morning to cook, to feed these 70 people, and they get a hot meal, uh, hot uh, sweet, and infinite and tea and coffee. And they're lovely people. And we do that as a, a service, as a church. Final question uh, to you, Julian. As, as you think about, you know, what God has for you, how are you praying about your future involvement? What are the things that you're asking God to, to show you that you might get further involved in? Um, well, I'm looking for opportunities particularly, but for the last 19 months, I haven't been able to take anything on uh, because of caring for, for Jill. But there is lots of things that I want to do. I actually do some work on Hope Valley, at Hope Valley, Hope FM, and uh, the, the local Christian radio station. I enjoy doing that. But when before I came here, I was for five years had my own program on called Faith Time in Somerset on one of the top. I can say this. Uh, regional radio stations uh, because we won the award as the best in the UK and I was part of that <laughs> which I'm proudly able to say <laughs> Shame, shameless plug shameless plug yes um, I just want to add two or three come on then quickly there, then there is a danger when you give me a microphone yeah, I know I can <laughs> see that <laughs> um, I have a dear friend down here um, and he's been to many churches he's um, Five years older than I am, okay, so he's quite old. And he's been to many churches, um, but he tells me out of all the churches he's been to, he really finds this a lovely, happy, caring church. And he, um, he's going to take the microphone off of me, and I haven't finished yet. Um, but uh, but uh, it, it is, you have a lot to work for. Do volunteer where you can, please, all right, because we need more helpers in this church. And I'm going to find a few more things for me to do eventually. Good. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. One of the things, of course, that uh, we can all do is, is get involved in the life of Lansdowne. People like Julian and, and others are, are very much part of the army of volunteers. Another way in which you can share is by giving financially to the church. We don't, we don't really make, make much at all of, of giving in Lansdowne, but there is a little leaflet that we've been uh, produced for the last three or four months. You'll find it on the information point as you leave this morning. You might want to uh, pick it up, how to give financially uh, to Lansdowne Church. And, and you, some of you will notice that we have now a card reader in our midst. And if you want to donate uh, spontaneously uh, on a Sunday, then the card reader will also be uh, there uh, 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 at the information point. And if you look at the screen, can we have the slide? There we are. Do you know one of those, what's one of those called? A QR code, yeah? And uh, if you have a, you know, a mobile phone like me and you put the camera on and you can, you can follow the, 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 the instructions on the QR code and it's a way of, of you helping to give to Lansdowne. So there are lots of modern ways now of, uh, of sharing with each other, getting involved and, as I say, giving 
financially. Okay, we're going to change gear now quite quickly. So why don't you meet somebody, greet someone this morning, say hello, and we'll have the, the family up onto the platform. Just say hello to folks now as we get uh, uh, our friends up here on the platform. Okay, so here we have the, the lovely uh, Emeka family with us this morning. They've been in Lansdowne probably about a month now, I think. Uh, you, you, you're living in Boscombe, you've begun to worship with us and are part of this growing African contingent who we love very much uh, with us every, every week. And, and this lad is heavenly. This is your boy, heavenly. And, and this is the one that we're going to make a lot of fuss of this morning. This is... Ivy, and she's fast asleep, all right? So I shall speak quietly and not wake her up. But we are going to ask God to bless her as we bring her to the Lord Jesus for dedication. And this is Daniel, the dad, and Josephine, the mum. These are, these are important occasions for us as a family. They, they, they say, don't they, that it takes a village to raise a child. And that's what we are, really. We're a spiritual village. Mums and dads, aunts and uncles, young and old, all involved in bringing our, our children up in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's what we're doing this morning, uh, Josephine and, and Daniel. We're dedicating your little one, Ivy, to the Lord Jesus and asking him to bless her and Heavenly too, who has a great name. Um, I have a boring name, Peter. That's so boring. Your name is so exciting, Heavenly. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Do you, Daniel and Josephine, profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, yes, me too. And do you promise by God's help to bring your lovely daughter Ivy up in the Christian faith as God helps you? Yes, yes we, do. we do. Family of Lansdowne, please stand, will you, with us as we ask you to pray for and support this family as they come amongst us, the makers. Lansdowne family and friends, will you pray for and support Heavenly and Josephine and Daniel and Ivy as they grow up amongst us and come to trust the Lord Jesus? We, we do. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this little one. We pray your blessing upon the whole family, upon Heavenly, upon Josephine, upon Daniel. Thank you for them and their faith in Christ. Ivy, the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, now and always. Amen. 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 I mean, this is a good workout. Please sit down. Now, you've chosen a song, which when I went to see this family, I said, we normally have a song, and I, and I don't know whether you know any of our songs, and last Sunday, we sang a song that you knew, and that's the one you've chosen, the goodness of God, isn't it? It's your testimony that God is good all the time, and that's what we're thanking God for here as you brought your little one to church today. So let's stand and sing, the goodness of God.
again. And uh, my thanks to our little ones and teachers for being patient this morning. Just give me two more minutes, all right, guys? Two more minutes, and then you can go off to your uh, activities, your, your programs, and we'll see you for tea and coffee at the end. Three key notices. On Thursday at 7.30, we meet with other Christians and churches in the area to pray big for Israel and the Middle East situation. Uh, every day, the news becomes more uh, traumatic and more challenging for all of us. We want to be praying for peace to reign uh, and for violence to stop. So join us on Thursday for that Pray Big event from 7.30 until about 9. Next weekend, a really key weekend for us as a, as a local church. We're looking to appoint to the staff Chris Sinkinson as an associate minister here. And so he'll be preaching all day uh, next Sunday. But from 12.30 until 2 uh, next Saturday afternoon, there's a chance to meet and greet uh, Chris and his wife, uh, Roz, as they uh, come and share that time with us. Probably be meeting in the hub. It's a, an open invite to all to come and meet uh, Chris and Roz uh, more personally and find out a bit more about them. Uh, Members will note that at the end of the evening service uh, next Sunday, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, where we can uh, find out more about Chris's background and his story. For teachers and teaching assistants and governors uh, and those support workers in schools, note next Sunday afternoon is a special education lunch for you as well. Please uh, sign up on our website to tell us uh, that you're coming. That's next Sunday next weekend, a really key weekend for us. And then finally, we're planning another baptismal service uh, at the beginning of December, the 3rd of December in the morning. We had such a, a wonderful service last Sunday, and several people requested baptism next time around. So if that's you, or if you're here this morning thinking about baptism, let us know by going to the information point at the end or contacting the church office by email. That's a baptismal service on December the 3rd uh, in, in the morning uh, worship time. All right, kids, you've been really, really great this morning. Have a, away you go. Have a good time, and we'll see you all later uh, for tea and coffee. What do you find uh, in your Bibles? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9. You may be aware that our motto text for 2023 has been that little verse out of Hebrews, encourage one another. And so what we're doing over these few Sunday mornings through November is to go back to that theme of what it means to belong to church, to one another. And uh, this morning, Mike's going to be uh, speaking to us uh, on the theme, Share with One Another. And uh, we're basing our, 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 our message this morning around two bits of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So can you find then 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 9, and then we'll read into uh, chapter 9 as well. Paul has been um, encouraging Christians, Gentile Christians to uh, support financially Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who are in need. He's sort of got a crowdfund program going together. He's crowdfunded the need in Jerusalem. And the church in Corinth showed every indication of, of responding to that need financially. And so Paul, in this correspondence, is following up their promise uh, to give to the needs of, of poor relief in, in Jerusalem. And he's encouraging these Christians to, to finish what they've started. That's the context of 2 Corinthians 8. Let's read the first nine verses uh, together. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord... And then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, 
to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And then into the next chapter, chapter 9, and we're reading from verses 6 to 11. Paul has been, in the intervening verses, explaining how this whole collection is going to happen and reinforcing their commitment to it. So chapter 9 from verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. May God, by His Spirit, Bless his word to us and help us to understand it as Mike in a moment preaches. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the family of believers. Thank you that across the world today we unite in heart and mind with, with those who are in a context of suffering and persecution. Those whose circumstances are difficult. Those whose lives are overshadowed by pressures of one kind or another. And therefore, we reach out to them across the globe. And in our seasons of plenty, some of us, we want to be generous to those who are living in a season of need. For Lord, we all live within this wider circle of Christian family in which some of us are rejoicing in your blessing and are able to share that blessing with others. Thank you for Julian's story amongst us just now. Encourage him and many others as we get involved together, sharing in the good things of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the family who brought little Ivy to dedication this morning. Bless them too. And the many nations of the world who are amongst us week by week. Lord, give us that kind of capacity, a big heart that welcomes everyone in the name of Jesus and prays for and supports each other. Lord, our hearts are broken by the situation in the Middle East. We continue to remember any Christian churches who are worshiping in Gaza still. We pray for the plight of the Palestinians particularly. We pray for the release of hostages taken by Hamas two weeks ago now. Lord, it's, it's hard to know what to pray. We call out to you, sovereign Lord of the nations, in mercy. Bring about a, a, a just and lasting settlement, we pray. Lord, be with those who who are significantly involved in securing the means of a lasting peace. Leaderships on all sides. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for those communities where there is oppression and injustice. We pray that we will have, as a local church, a vision that encompasses the nations of the world. 
We pray for ourselves here as next weekend we receive uh, Chris and Ros Sinkinson. We pray for guidance in our journey with them. We pray for our young people and uh, our little ones as, they, as they've gone to their classes now. Lord, thank you for the different ages and stages that we are as a church family. May your spirit be powerfully at work. And bless Mike as he opens up this theme to us this morning. As he shares from what you've shared with him from your word, may we receive blessing. And may there be for all of us a harvest of righteousness as a result of our being here today. For you are a good and gracious king. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So one more song, and then Mike comes and opens up that passage to us. It's the song, Good and Gracious King, I Love You, Lord. Let's stand and sing.
please do sit down. Turn with me to that passage uh, that Peter so helpfully put in its right context for us just a moment ago, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Are you ready for God to speak to you this morning? Oh, someone is. No, no seriously, it, it's really about the attitude of our hearts, isn't it? The extent to which we hear from God when his word is read or proclaimed. And so let's just take a moment. I'm very grateful for Peter praying for me, certainly. But let's just take a moment. It's your opportunity to get right with the Lord. And if you don't know him, you're very welcome here this morning. Ask for him to make himself known to you. Let's just take a moment in the quiet. Father, you've heard these prayers of our hearts. We trust you now to make yourself known through Jesus, by your Spirit, in these moments. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, here is a very, very important question. How will you know if God is at work in your life? How will you know if you've received his grace? How will you know if that grace is continuing to operate in you today as much as it was yesterday? Or, or for us together here, how, how will we know that God is at work in this church, his family, the body of Christ? How will we know if he is at work in the church that bears his name across this land and throughout this world. Oh, thank you, because that's a good answer. But there are many, and the answer of this passage this morning, very specifically, is this. It will be seen in the way we give. You see, uh, as we return this morning to our One Another series, this brings us uh, to the title which Peter's already mentioned, Sharing with One Another. Sharing with one another from what God has shared with us, providing for one another, delighting to give. You see, uh, as we've already been reminded, as Paul writes, he cannot get the Jerusalem church out of his mind and heart suffering fierce persecution and grinding poverty. The church in Corinth agreed to help. And so he's writing them to them again now to stir them back into action. But he's got a motive even higher than that simple motive through their generosity he hopes to alleviate the great need in Jerusalem. His higher aim throughout this whole letter is he wants to ensure that God really is at work in their lives, that they really do belong to him, that his saving grace has truly been received by every heart. Because he knows if they do not persevere in what he describes here as the grace of giving, how can they be sure, how can he be sure that they've received that grace at all? You see, the first thing we see here is that sharing is an overflow of grace. Sharing is an overflow of grace, verses 1 to 9. I mean, this is where he starts. He, he says, well, you just look at those churches away there in Macedonia, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. What's he talking about? Well, he mentions it very specifically in the next words. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy 
and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. These were not rich churches. What does he say? Extreme poverty. And it was not because those churches were in the midst of experiencing great times. No, it was in the midst of a very severe trial. No, something else was happening. Did you know how he described it? Overflowing joy. Welling up in what? Rich generosity. In other words, God's grace in them was bursting out. Uh, The last time I remember rain, like we had last night and and through yesterday, um, I I was standing on on the banks of the River Thames, and and there was so much water that had welled up under the ground that it was literally bursting through the manhole covers. It was like a waterfall. It was never supposed to be like that, of course, but, but, but that's what it was, overflowing. And that's the joy that Paul is speaking of here, the joy of what God's grace does in the hearts of his people. And you will see it in their rich generosity. And so he goes on, verse 3, For I testify, this is Paul now explaining what that actually looked like, I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Do you get the picture here? Do you see this water bursting out? They say, Paul, forget the fact that we've got virtually nothing. Please let us give. We've heard about the great need of our brothers and sisters in the church in Jerusalem, and we have to give. Uh, When you've tasted this generosity pouring out of the hearts of others. Let me tell you, when you've tasted that like Paul, you don't forget it quickly. As I was preparing this, it reminded me of something. A specific occasion, which I can remember, and I had to work it out, 26 years ago. That's a long time for somebody as young as me. Sandy and I were in Cairo We were carefully and cautiously visiting the family, uh, the home of a young family of Muslim converts. They had lost so much in turning to Christ. I'll never forget as the young children were shut away sleeping in the other room, how they told us of one night when he was arrested. Can you imagine what it was like for that young mum those children in her arms, what has happened? Would they ever see him again? I remember that night because of those things. But I also remember that night because of their incredibly rich generosity. You see, because of their choice to follow Christ, they now had almost nothing. And yet they insisted, they pleaded with us for the privilege of feeding us like kings and queens. And as we left, the person who'd taken us there said, they probably won't be able to eat for the next couple of days or so. And they were delighted to do it. Have you tasted that? You see, we sensed just how profoundly that little family had given themselves over to the Lord. Just like Paul sensed from those Macedonian churches. Listen to him describe it, verse 5. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. That's why they were doing this. They'd given themselves to him. They'd picked themselves up and said, we belong to you, Lord Jesus, and you alone. And then, by the will of God, he says, they gave themselves also to us. You see, God's grace produces such overflowing joy that it always wells up in this bursting forth of rich generosity everywhere. It's just like those drains. In fact, can't you see it right here? In this church family, I mean. Didn't we witness something of it just a moment ago, as Julian shared? People sharing their homes. 
people here giving financially uh, with much sacrifice. People providing clothes. Practical support in all kinds of ways, physically, emotionally, getting alongside one another. People giving hours and hours and hours and time that they will never get back, but doing so in joy and delight. Haven't you seen it? Well, seeing it is what drives Paul to urge everyone, including those believers in Corinth who are not currently exhibiting this generosity. This is what drives him to urge them to join in as well. Listen to him speaking to them. And let's trust by the Spirit. He speaks to us in these words where we need to hear it. Verse 6. So we urge Titus, just as he'd made uh, earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. That's that collection. So Titus goes on Paul's behest to urge them to get back to the giving of grace, which is what he then describes it as in the next verse. He says, but since you excel, Christian believers in Corinth, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we've kindled in you. I mean, they are overflowing in all these graces of God. But Paul remains concerned because where giving is absent, a question mark remains. And so he says, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. There's the challenge. I mean, they were doing so well in other ways, but there's a gaping hole. Where's the grace of giving, says Paul? Are you excelling in it? And so you and I need to ask ourselves the same question. Am I eagerly looking around me for the needs that God has provided me with resources because God wants to meet those needs through what he's given me? Excelling in the grace of giving will mean you and I choosing to live below our means, sometimes well below our means, so that we can abound in providing for the needs of others. So we can give to the work of mission across the world. So that we can give to the very real needs of those who live across the street. So that you can give more and more and more, releasing the most abounding of resources to the work of the gospel and delighting in it. And why is Paul so desperate to see that grace of giving in them and in you and me? It's because this is the grace we find in Christ. You see, if you're in him, if you're in him, This grace will burst out of you. If we are in him, this grace will burst out of us. In that sense, says Paul, it's a test. That's how he describes it, verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. You Corinthian church, I'm now comparing with the Macedonian churches. It's not a competition, but it is a test Is the grace of Christ evident in you? Because this is what the grace of Christ is like, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. This grace is found in Christ. What are we told in that ninth verse? Though he was rich. I mean, everything you ever taste or smell or touch or see or receive, anything you own belongs to Christ. It's his. And there are certainly some in this world who amass great wealth, aren't there? I noticed that poor Bill Gates has slipped down to sixth now on the world rich list. He's only got $114 billion to his name. And if you want to sleep in the the most uh, luxurious hotel in the world, which actually is a submarine, by the way. I didn't know this before yesterday. It's called Lover's Deep. You will need £150,000 a night. 
But if you've got 114 billion, I did do the sums, I mean, you've got over 1,000 years to sleep in that, in that hotel room. And that's just one. And this world is full of riches, and all these riches are given to us by the one who created all of this. You know, this created world, if you like, is just the edge of the overflow of the riches that is truly to be found within God himself. Riches that are truly to be appreciated in that loving communion between Father and Spirit and Son. And we're reminded here, though he was rich like that, yet for your sake he became poor. Exchanging the riches of heaven for the poverty of a cross. Falling to the point where he had no possessions left, no clothes, and utterly alone. In fact, so spiritually impoverished under the curse of our sin that his father could no longer even look upon him turned his face away. That's our poverty. That's what we deserve. And yet Christ took that poverty, ours, why? So that through his poverty, you and I could become rich, share his glory. How does Paul describe it in the opening of 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 Ephesians 1? He says um, that we all share every spiritual blessing in Christ. Or to put more simply, we can now enjoy his intimacy with the Father. Because we can now enjoy his spirit living within us. Yes, you and me. I mean, talk about the ultimate rags to riches story, isn't it? Uh, Last year when Antoine and I were in that North African country we've been calling Maureen. If you've been around a while, you'll have heard of it. If not, this might be new to you. Uh, But for security reasons, we're calling it Maureen, seeking to to have God take this wonderful good news to those unreached peoples in that place. I I can still remember driving uh, past a a poor cripple standing literally in the middle of the highway with cars rushing by on either side. He was standing on two stumps. He was no higher than this. What really brought it home to me was the previous day we had been wined and dined by one of the richest families in that country. And then it suddenly struck me. I would have been hard pushed to find one individual round that table of riches who would have chosen to spend even a day alongside that man in the middle of his poverty in the street. Let alone take his place so that that man could have theirs at the table of feasting. And this is what the Lord Jesus has done, isn't it? This is what he has done. And it's out of these riches given to you and me that we can now give. It's one way we can all worship. And the wonderful thing is, it doesn't matter how much you have. You see, God is not looking for wealthy people. I mean, it's all his anyway. No, he is looking for willing hearts. That's the third thing here. Because sharing becomes worship when the giving is willing. Sharing is worship when it's willing. Verses 10 to 12. Verse 10 then. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. He's talking about this collection. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. That they wanted to. Did did you sense there was an eager willingness back then, says Paul? Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. You see, he's not causing them or calling them or expecting them to give what they don't have. Why? Because verse 12, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable to, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. You see, God sees your heart. In fact, your heart is all he really cares about. And if your gift is willing, he will be delighted. So will you give something that is precious to you? 
willingly, joyfully. Years ago, um, God gave me a very specific challenge. I'm not certain I've ever shared it with anyone before this moment. I was even struggling last night. Should I share this? I don't want to ruin it, Lord, but anyway, I'm going to share it. Many, many years ago, I was given a Christmas present by my sister-in-law of £40 specifically to buy a coffee grinder. I know, it's not exactly exciting stuff, is it? But but the the year before, I'd been given a coffee machine, and I'd become a bit of an overnight barista. And um, and I absolutely loved it. It's like a hobby. Maybe it says something about my life, doesn't it? (laughs) Um, But I, I wanted a grinder so I could grind my own beans. And there was that 40 pounds as Christmas went into the new year. I so wanted that grinder. Now I could get it. Uh, The the problem, of course, was the day before I went into John Lewis to go and look at it and and pick it up, hopefully, I was listening to a sermon. (laughs) A sermon about the grace of giving. And so the battle began. A battle in me, in my heart. I can remember several times, actually, I went in the shop and looked at it there on the shelf. And as I was looking at it, the most amazing thing, I believed I couldn't do without it. A coffee grinder. Well, hadn't I been given the money for it anyway? I wouldn't my sister, oh, she'd be ever so upset if I didn't buy the coffee grinder. Well, I mean, truth be told, she'd probably forgotten about it already. I mean, it's only a coffee grinder. But whenever I stopped to look at Jesus, I could hear him asking me the simplest of questions. Do you love me? Do you love me more than a coffee grinder? (laughs) He wasn't asking me to pay him back. But the more I focused on the riches of his love to me, the more I wanted some way to respond in worship. And I simply couldn't get beyond that 40 pounds sitting in my pocket. And here was another opportunity. In my heart, he won the battle. And his mission was extended by 40 pounds. Who knows how he multiplied it to meet the need. And in me, well, that joy had set me free. We can all enjoy this privilege of worship, you know. The question is, are you willing? Will you look out for those opportunities around you? They will be there. Will you pray for them? Looking to give to the needs as soon as you hear of them. I mean, even if it's only a little. But of course, it's not only those spontaneous responses that God is looking for in worship. We can plan to worship too. I mean, Paul had already made that clear in his first letter. Sound advice about this collection for every member of the church before he arrived. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, he says, On the first day of the week... Each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Simple as that. I mean, we can all do this, you know, with what we receive. I mean, let's be super clear about this. I've had people uh, over the years ask me, especially for those who are in relationships with someone who doesn't yet know the Lord. Uh, you know, for whom there's, there's a shared you know, response to their, their finances. Well, what can I do, Lord Jesus? Well, it's as simple as this. What of that money do you consider that is yours and yours alone? And as you receive that, will you surrender something from it to the Lord Jesus? And of course, as God blesses with more than you really need, And that pattern is set. Your heart will be set free to worship him in this way more and more and more. You see, Christ has made you rich so that you can. Will you trust him and give even more? You see, ultimately, this worship of sharing is all about faith. 
It's all about faith, which brings us to that, that, that passage in chapter 9, verse 6 to 11. It's all about faith. Uh, because our giving demonstrates our trust, our faith in God to provide for us. Let me read verse 6. Remember this, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I mean, it, it's a simple principle. If a farmer sows few seeds, he'll be disappointed. <laughs> Want a bumper harvest? Well, sow generously. Uh, in other words, if we remain stingy or, or give with a reluctant heart, what are we really expecting in return? The question is, though, and it's an important one, what is the return that God is speaking about here? Is this giving more money to get yet more money? Some have certainly understood it this way and twisted it to, to, to make some justification that the gospel really is a means to financial gain. Not at all. No, what's the goal here? What's the goal? What's the increase? What's the abundance? You need to ask yourself that question. Well, we begin to get the answer in verse 7. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? What's the goal? For God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. God's delight. God's pleasure. And how do we get that? How do we earn God's pleasure? Well, of course, you can't earn God's pleasure. It's through Christ alone. But in Christ alone, how do you gain what he's given you? By living in Christ to please your Father in heaven. And he is able to give you everything you need to do that. Verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, what? You will get rich. Well, not materially. No, 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 no. He is able to give you all that at every moment. Why? Yes, so that you may abound in something, but what is it? So that you may abound in every good work, so that you may abound in every good work. You see, you can give without fear that you'll ever have to do without. And you can give knowing that he'll be delighted because he's able to give you everything you need for that righteousness of Christ. You see, sticking with the farming picture, he's promising us a bumper crop of what? Of righteousness. Because that is the only thing that brings the delight of God in your life and in mine. Look at verse 9. And it's written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that is God, of course, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of what? Of your righteousness. In other words, let me put it simply like this. We give trusting in the righteousness of Jesus that in the giving, our action may become a delight and a pleasure to God in the righteousness of Jesus. You see, when you trust him like this, your overflowing generosity will result in thanksgiving to him. Temporarily, this would result in thanksgiving way back there in the church in Jerusalem, wouldn't it? When, when the collection comes in, as you give to provide for the needs, some of which we've even heard from the platform this morning, there'll be thanksgiving to God for those who've got eyes to see it. Oh, but Paul here has his eyes on an even greater goal, a thanksgiving to God that literally will never end. Verse, verse 11, 
you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You know, friends, this is what we're ultimately looking forward to. The celebration of an abundant harvest. And let me remind you, that's one of the pictures of heaven itself. I mean, think wedding. Uh, only don't think wedding in kind of our culture. <laughs> you need to have something far more exuberant in your minds, okay? That celebration at the gathering in of the harvest, singing and dancing, feasting and rejoicing, joyful, happy conversations. And what is causing all the joy? Well, it's so simple. The harvest is now in. Do you see, on that day and for all eternity, we will all be celebrating the magnificence of Jesus. Of course we will, but for specific things. Don't ever forget this. We will be praising and giving thanks to God for all those righteous things that he is bringing about in your life today. Let me ground this in coffee, if you will, as we close. For all of us in Christ, as we are gathered there with the angels in heaven, and as heaven and earth has come together and is one, and we rejoice at that celebration of the feasting, without limit of time or space, a time will come when all will fall silent and hear the story of Mike and the coffee grinder. And when that story is finished, I fully anticipate on the authority of God's word that a roar will go up from every living creature and angel and child and daughter and son of God. This is incredible. Lord Jesus, see what you did in Mike that day. And because time is no problem, I think we'll hear it more than once. Just think, just think what overflowing thanksgiving those stories that have yet to be written because of the ways that God is going to prompt you by his spirit in the generosity and righteousness of Jesus to give. What a thought. And brothers and sisters, this is true. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have invited us into a privilege such as this. And we confess um, we're struggling really to even grasp it in its magnificence. And I certainly feel this morning I'm struggling to convey it in a way that is in any way, shape or form, even remotely close to the magnificence of what we're really talking about here. The beauty and the magnificence and, and the riches that are found in Christ alone, worked out in our very lives as you enable us to give with his abundant generosity. Oh Lord, we want, we want more of this. So, so give us opportunities. Give us resources. And set us free from ever thinking any of that is to build our kingdom. And Lord, may this worship through your people in this place be increasingly something that you delight in as you see Jesus as our hearts choose to give. stand as we respond in worship. God
has given us everything, even the very breath that we breathe. So let's respond in song.
So, Lord, as we give and share and get involved, as we serve, as we love, enlarge the harvest of our righteousness, we pray. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please, friends, take your seats. And as you go to coffee, be served on two levels here at the Hub and on the first floor. There's a prayer point uh, for those who want to pray stuff back in, into their lives. People will be here for prayer to serve you there. And then the information point, don't forget that little leaflet on how to give uh, into the ministry of Lansdowne Church. If you haven't had one of those, please pick one up. And uh, tonight we're back for Sundays at 7. Chris Kelly will be uh, speaking to us about the next bit of our uh, basis of faith. That's the future and the great hope we have to look forward to in Jesus Christ. So that's tonight, Sundays at 7. Have a good day. The Lord bless you.